told that. But nevertheless, this is part of what we do in worship to God because we love Him and want to obey Him. And it's encouragement to see all involved in that singing. One of the uh, great obligations laid upon the elders of the church, really on every member, but especially the duties of the elders requiring, is those who teach false doctrine, their mouths must be stopped. Now, when it comes down to people disagreeing with you or me, when it comes to opinions, likes and dislikes and all that stuff, that's a very small thing. But when it comes to people disagreeing with God, going against His Word, then that's another matter indeed. What do we do about it? What's our job? It's not that it's a thing one looks forward to. It's not a thing that's always pleasant. In fact, I don't know any of it being pleasant. But nevertheless, it's in your Bible. It's there for your information. It lays obligations on you according to your several abilities. The attitude of many members of the Lord's Church today amazes me. They'll say, surely you don't think, brother, so-and-so is a false teacher. Now, I'm going to pause here and tell you something. I got the idea to preach this because I was going through some old papers. And I came across this one. Now, I say this one, this idea. It was 1973. You're going to find out as we go through it because I decided to take the sentiments expressed in it that long ago and show you that people back then were equally, if not more so, concerned about false doctrine. People are simply aghast that one could think a fellow member of the body of Christ to be a false teacher. Uh, question. Seeing that there's so much said in the New Testament about Christian living, and so much of that has to do with warning us, Christians, not to follow false doctrine, and so much is revealed in the New Testament of members of the church of the first century, even while the New Testament was being written, written down, that there would be men arise who would teach false doctrine, which we'll refer to more. Then what about today? I think sometimes we just sort of read that book as if it was some uh, one-time happening in history. It never can happen again, and wasn't that something back then? But it's not. There's always been false teachers among God's people, always. I don't know how anybody can read the Bible and not find that out. The apostle wrote, but there were false preachers also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, 2 Peter 2, 1 even as there shall be false teachers among you, among you. Was that just of the people who originally received this letter? Or as a part of the New Testament, it covers the church to the end of time. To a group of elders whom Paul loved very dearly, here's what he said. I know that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you. You do, Paul? Not sparing the flock. You mean they don't care about the church? Also of your own selves, elders who are to, under pastors to Christ, shall men arise, speaking not the truth, but perverse things. You know, you can't pervert an error. You pervert the truth. So speaking perverse things means truth that's been perverted. It's been twisted to make something that it doesn't teach. And why do they do it? To draw away to the, the disciples after them. Acts 20, 29, 30. So I learned how the great apostasy that began in the first century actually took place. Paul says, I know that's going to happen. I've often wondered how those fellows felt when, they, when he said, now after I leave, here's what's going to happen. It's going to come out from among you. The fact that a teacher is eloquent doesn't mean he's accurate. If a friend, that's no proof he's factual. Being a good mixer does not prove he's preaching the truth. And even his sincerity is no guarantee He's speaking as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4.11. Now, let me say again, referring to that article. That's taken directly from that article almost 50 years ago. And back in those days, when I was a little bit younger than I am now, <laughs> I could read articles written in the 60s and 50s and 40s. And on back, 
because I collected quite a few of those old papers all the way back in the 19th century. Still have them. Same thing was being said. Same thing was being said. The first major division among the Lord's people after the restored church came into being in the 19th century, came from among brethren, developing into the Christian church and then leaving the church to walk according to the truth of the New Testament. So will there ever be a time that's not needed? No. As long as the Lord's people are gathered here, whether they're few or small, this must be preached. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly. What are they, what, what are they really? Ravening wolves. Why did Jesus say that? They want to trouble us. They just want to upset our happy place and upset our happy meal. <laughs> well, was he just talking about other groups, religious groups or philosophical groups? Well, not us. No, not us. Then what of John's warning? Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try or prove the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are going out into the world, 1 John 4, 1. Remember the New Testament's being written. Apostles still walk this earth. And even while it's being set down on paper, this is what's going on. The inclination to believe everything and everybody is neither godly nor sensible. With people calling evil good and good evil, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, and my, that's 750 years before Christ walked this earth. And that was being said then. You think it's changed? Isaiah 8, 20. We find, he says in that passage, to the law and to the prophets, or to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And I might add to that, regardless of how pretty they dress, how educated they are, how well they smile, or how well they smell. The idea of investigation. Investigation is found in God's commendation to those of Berea. Acts 17, 11, as you well know, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? In that they received the word with all readiness of mind. Watch it. Examining the scriptures daily. Daily whether these things were so. What a thought. If we're really interested in pleasing God, we won't be blinded by friendship, glad-handing, and eloquence. We will search the scriptures for ourselves to see the message came from God. By the way, that sentence, if we're really interested in pleasing God, we will not be blinded by friendship, glad-handing, and eloquence, came directly from that article in 1973. Someone says, but we're not to judge. I, you know, I don't guess that will ever disappear. We're not to judge. I mean, how much does it take in the way of thought and education for the person who says we're not to judge to realize he's just judged? How do you educate somebody out of that which is so obvious that an education is not necessary to see it? So that seems to be one of the most common defense offered for false teachers is to say, well, you can't judge them. When Jesus said, judge not, Matthew 7, 1, he explained the prohibition. Thy hypocrite first cast out the beam that is in thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote that is in thy brother's eye, verse 5. Now there's the explanation. He says, don't judge, in the light of what those people were doing and he didn't com condemn their judgment. He just says you can't do what you're trying to do if you got your thumb stuck in your eye and you're trying to remove an elephant out of somebody else's. But he doesn't stay, stop judging at all because you have to make a judgment to know whether the elephant's in the eye. Remember that the Lord also commands us to judge righteous judgment, John 7, 24. Now God seemed to think we could do that. Remembering that Righteous is defined in Psalm 119, verse 172. All thy commandments are righteousness. So it means we judge in the light of God's authority, God's word, God's commandments. And we also apply Matthew 7, 1 to the action of examining teachers 
when it comes uh, to their perversion of the passage. So there's an examining on our part right now concerning those who would pervert Matthew 7, 1 to see what it really says in the light of the totality of the scriptures such as John 7, 24 and really what the context of Matthew 7, 1 is and the kind of judgment that was being done. It was being done by hypocrites. When the apostle Paul had to deal with the case of a sinful brother at Corinth, he said, I have already judged. I have already judged. Then he said to the Christians there, Do not ye judge them that are within, that is, inside the church? Put away from among yourselves that wicked person. 1 Corinthians 5, 3 and verses 12 through 13. And Jesus gave plain warning in Matthew 7, 15 and 16, Beware false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Well, is that... Those, are those just words to no avail? Do they not offer us anything? Do they not give us anything? But how can one determine that a teacher is a false prophet without judging? How? I'd like to see somebody show me that. The fact is that God demands that we obey the truth. And I have to know the difference in truth and error. That's a judgment on my part. And he puts the responsibility on, her, on us to discern the truth. Now, why would he do that if it's impossible for us to do it? Do this. Now, I know you can't do it, but do it. It stands between you and God and going to heaven, but you do it. But I know you can't do it. God never promises blessings to those who follow the wrong teaching. Let me emphasize that again. God never promises blessings on those that follow teaching contrary to his word. Then we see marking and avoiding them. Well, what are we going to do in the case of a teacher who teaches error? I think we all agree that uh, error is contrary and against the truth. So when you have somebody teaching something contrary and against the truth, what do you do about it? Is there nothing we can do about it as children of God? If a good friend may be, we should just overlook it. And perhaps he'll someday learn better by osmosis or something. That just doesn't work that way. I noticed this a long time ago, and it is part of the tactics of people who don't want to be stopped from teaching their false doctrine, or they want to defend those who teach false doctrine. And it's a psychological thing. If you read about how to get along in a hostage situation, where someone has come in with a gun or threatening to blow himself up or whatever it is, and he's got several people hostage, one of the guidelines so that he won't be so distant from you and not think of you as a fellow human is that you begin to try to make a personal relationship with him. You begin to try to get him to see that you're a person of like passions. You're not such a bad guy. You try to develop this personal relationship with him. That disarms him. That stops him from, or helps to, stop him from deciding to blow you up or shoot you or cut your head off or whatever it is you're going to do. You get to know him. Let me say that again. You get to know him. He gets to know you. It's just harder to do people in when you know them, when you're personally acquainted, when you have a personal attachment. So one of the things and guidelines is that if you're ever taken hostage, you want to build that relationship. You want to be kind and nice and show him you're just as human as he is and you're sympathetic, you're understanding, we all have tough times, and let him get to thinking of you as a fellow human being. Well, guess what? False teachers know that. And thus, and I actually had this happen to me one time, though I've heard of it happening more than once with others. I had written some over around 30 years ago something that exposed the false teacher and called his name. I got a phone call from him. He didn't want to discuss in the light of the Bible what was said, no, what he had said, and then what I had said regarding what he had published. He wanted to have a cup of coffee with me. He wanted us to meet somewhere. He wanted us to sit down and visit. Now, guess what he's up to? If he can establish that 
I'm just as much human as you are. We're both good guys. We both are preachers. We both are this, that, and the other. Then you don't tend to get after people as much, and you disarm them. I am amazed that brethren don't understand that. They just can't see through what Paul says are Satan's devices. And yet Paul said, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, but I fear many of us are. So what can work well in a hostage situation may disarm you and remove from you the sword of the Spirit in another situation. So it doesn't make any difference how personally you are involved with the person or how many years you've been personally involved with them. You can't let that stop you from doing what you know the Bible says because guess what? All us humans, one by one, are going to stand before the Lord in the judgment someday, and it won't make any difference what kind of relationship we had with each other here, how big buddies we were or how big buddies we weren't. It's not going to make one bit of difference. But the righteous judge shall judge, and each one of us will sit before or stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be judged out of his word and the things done in our body. So when it comes down to understanding the truth of the thing or whether the thing is error, we have to examine it objectively. You just can't do it. So don't tell me that that attitude is not in the body of Christ today. It's been in the body of Christ as long as I've been in the body of Christ. And I promise you a whole lot longer because these things were discussed in the first century in the writing of the New Testament. And all you have to do is read the prophets in the Old Testament to see the same thing was there. So we should not have that attitude when it comes down to determining right from wrong in the light of the rightly divided word. If we do, then we're going to fall down somewhere. With concern for the soul, we should take him aside and teach him the way of the Lord more perfectly as done with Apollos, Acts 18, 26. If that's possible. You know, when Aquila and Priscilla did that because they recognized he knew only the baptism of John and they recognized that from his teaching, that is, what he lacked in his knowledge, but he was an eloquent man. They did what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 concerning one of the attributes of agape love. They believed all things. What does that mean? That this man would be teachable, that he was doing the best he could what he had to do with, but that he, to find out whether he was teachable, they didn't cause a big stir in the audience. They called him aside, and they taught him the way, as the scripture reads, the way of the Lord more perfectly. But he had to be teachable. It's one thing to say, I'm ready to teach anybody. But if anybody says, I don't want to be taught, <laughs> well, then you can't do it. But, you know, the truth still has to be taught, regardless of what people do or how they respond to it. With concern for the soul, we should take him aside, if possible, and teach as they did Apollos, Acts 18, 26. When one hears from the truth, James 5, 19 today, I think that you need to do the same thing. If at all possible. Sometimes it's not possible. It has long been one of the things that we've dealt with in my whole life as a preacher and long before that, but especially with the growth of liberalism in the church, that when they teach whatever they want all over the place in various papers, as far wide as it can spread, and then when you challenge it publicly, well, you should have gone to him personally and talked to him about it. But it's a public matter, not a private matter. He didn't come and ask everybody else if he could teach his doctrine before he taught it. He just taught it. But then you can't deal with it unless you go personally and talk to him about it. You can't find that in the scriptures. Oh, what about Matthew 18? That's where a matter starts between two individual Christians. And if they're what they ought to be, you deal with them there and you end it there. But if the one in sin will not hear the one that's come to him about the sin that he committed personally against the one coming to him. Then you take two or three witnesses in the mouth through the witness, every word should be established. But what if he won't hear them? Then you put it before the whole church. If the church is what it ought to be, it's going to bring its power to bear by every member going and saying, look, you need to reconcile this according to the truth. But then what happens in Matthew 18 if he won't hear the church? That ain't to be unto thee as he the man the publican. That's what the good book says. It means what it says, it says what it means. So that which could have been settled one-on-one, -on -one, known only to the two involved, and God has now got to the point, due to the impenitence of a person, to be all over the place. 
But that's a far cry different from somebody just starting out in some paper or something and putting it all over creation. That starts out public. But then I've got to be held according to Matthew 18 before I ever answer him publicly. No, we've dealt with that for years and years. If you look back over the lectureships and manuscripts all the way forever back down through there, and I'm letting my life be forever, all the way back down through there, you'll see that's been answered time and time and time again. Paul told Timothy, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, people believe false doctrine and teach false doctrine, they're not just opposing the church or God, they're opposing themselves. They're stopping themselves from going to heaven. He said that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, 2 Timothy 2, 25. The only way a person who's a Christian in sins can recover himself out of the snare of the devil is when he comes to grips with the sin and then does a following God's second law of pardon, repent of it and turn from it. A person's soul is important. Why well, make a statement of that? Don't you know, preacher, we already know that? I wonder if we really do. How important a soul is. Our job is to do what we can to save it. Ye which your spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. People think if you just do that, you automatically restore the person. Well, that's my responsibility as a faithful Christian. What about that person that needs to be restored's attitude toward that which he has violated? If you can't get him to see that, forget it. You can't, I don't care what you do, an example, if you can't get that person to realize his own personal duty and responsibility, there's not going to be any change. But I can do what I'm supposed to do, and you can do what you're supposed to do. What if the teacher persists in teaching error? Well, the Bible says, and Jesus states, through the Holy Spirit, that the Ephesians had tried them that say they are apostles, and they are not, and has found them liars or false, Revelation 2.2. Responsibility was on the church to try apostles. Can you think about why somebody would want to pass himself off as an apostle of Christ in the first century? You do that because you have authority that only they had. Because a true apostle spoke in Christ's stead by the Holy Spirit. I wonder how they tried them. Well, I look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. And Paul proved he was an apostle by saying, I have worked the signs of an apostle before you, and it was miraculous. So I can think of one way that those brethren in the church at Ephesus determined whether these were real apostles or were not. And that's because they couldn't work miracles. But they said they were apostles. Well, if you're apostles of Christ, you have the credentials of an apostle. But they didn't, so they weren't. Now, this also establishes the fact that sensible, faithful members of the church have the right to ask people what they believe and what they don't. Because these people did, and they found out those who claimed to be apostles were not, but found them false or liars. And Jesus commended them for it. You know, I like to be commended by Christ. But if I don't ask the right questions to the right people, then I'm just letting a doorway be open to false doctrine to come into the church. So questions need to be asked. Their influence was not allowed to contaminate the church. The same principles found in the command of Romans 16, 17. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Today, it seems like whether it's a university campus operated by the brethren or whether it's some other institution or paper, if somebody is a wild-eyed whatever, he teaches what nobody's heard but it's new and everybody runs after it and it appears to be quite philosophical and profound and all of that, you give them a platform. Why give them a platform? The Bible says plainly avoid them. Is there something difficult about avoid? If I tell you to avoid that car careening down the road out of control, do you have any problem understanding what that means that, that you need to do? Some today contend that such action is just too harsh. But it wasn't then. Why is it harsh now? What a lot of people mean is you've got my number and you've told me and others about it. And I didn't want that to happen. <laughs> That's exactly what that means. It's so harsh if it goes against us. 2 John verses 9 through 11 gives a potent reason for the imperative action of disassociating ourselves from those who teach error. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deed. 
So when we find somebody off base, poor old somebody, look how they're treating him. Come on home and let me feed you supper. And you go right contrary to what you know the Bible says. So I'm trying to dodge the force of this teaching by quibbling that doctrine here refers to only the divinity of Christ. If anybody agrees that Christ is God, then he can believe and teach anything else. That's not at all it. You go back over to Jesus in his day and warning the disciples of the Pharisees. He warned them of the doctrine of the Pharisees. Was he warning them about what it took to be a Pharisee? Or was he warning them about what they taught, how you live and what you do? And that's exactly what he's saying here. But with some people, I guess you'd have to say they're just going to partake of error no matter what. Now, God's given several reasons for marking in the teacher of error. After you told Timothy to shun profane babblings, and you have to know the truth before you know what a profane babbling is, Paul gives the results of such teaching. What does false doctrine do to a person? Their word will eat as doth a canker, gangrene, and overthrow the faith of some, 2 Timothy 2, 16 through 18. I don't want to be a party to overthrowing the faith of some. False doctrine does that. The same idea is found in Romans 16, 17, and 18. Mark them. Then he says, and avoid them. You know, I, marking them means calling their name. Now, I'm going to do something here. It was suggested by Buddy, and I think I know why. Uh, but I want everybody to stand up for a minute. Now, just turn around. Now, I'm not asking you to look at anything. Just turn. Now, now you can sit back down. And now I see Gene back there stretching. He took advantage of that, and that's what Buddy wanted to do. And that's the reason I asked you to do it is because what Buddy suggested. But you notice I said Buddy several times. I marked him. That's where it came from. I carried out what he wanted, and he was marked. You see, we don't mind calling names at certain times. We don't mind calling names at all. We just don't want to have our name called if it involves error. In fact, on that uh, wad of money, I'd like for you to call my name and say that's mine. Wouldn't bother me at all. I'd have to tell you it wasn't. But nevertheless, uh, wouldn't you like somebody had a lot of money to call your name and say I put you in my will? So it's not a matter of just simply, you're calling names. It's a matter of why they call your name. And I don't... Uh, I don't want to be marked and avoided because I really am a false teacher. And notice how a false teacher operates. By good words and fair speeches, they deceive or beguile the hearts of the simple, meaning the innocent. They take advantage of people. Did you know brethren are naive? Did you know that? Or is that a secret? Do you know that brethren don't know the Bible like they ought to and thus they don't see through things? Or is that a secret? Do you know that brethren don't know what's going on in little places of the brotherhood? Does they don't know where it's coming from or what's going on, but this is just good old boy? Or is that a secret? What's happening in New York today due to the Internet can be tearing up things out here in spring today. So this being vigilant, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time of the days are evil, even takes on new significance today with the ways things are communicated. So, the influence of teachers of error must not be allowed to destroy the faith of members of Christ church. When God gave the qualifications of elders, and I didn't give them, God did. That ought to make people sit up and take notice. God did. God gave the qualifications of elders in Titus chapter 1. Here's what he said. That they are hold, uh, holding to the faithful word as he hath been taught. If the elder's not going to do that, he's not qualified to be an elder. And notice holding too, tenaciously getting hold of something and hanging on to it, and nobody's going to get loose from it. You know, it's like a NRA, get hold of that gun, and they'll have to pry my cold fingers from it. That's holding on to the truth. That's what that basically is saying. I'll be dead before I give it up, and you'll have to pry my fingers loose from it then. So holding the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able, now watch that, Holding the faithful word. Why? That he may be able. There's something he's got to do. 
that he may be able by sound doctrine, wholesome teaching, both to exhort or exhort people to do what God said they ought to do and to convince the gainsayers. The gainsayers are those that do things because of money. Not do it because they love the Lord, want to keep commandments, it's proof of their love. Gainsayers. And that's part of their job. That's how they protect the flock. Then he says, for there are many, not a few, many unruly people who not, will not be controlled by law. Their mindset upon doing what they please when they please, no matter what they have to disrupt. There may, that there are many unruly and vain talkers. That is, vain is empty, worthless. They're talking contrary to the truth, and what they're saying is empty and worthless since it's not the truth. And then he zeroes in, especially the circumcision. That is, the Jews, and especially the Judaizing teachers who were determined to make the Gentiles second-rate citizens of the kingdom. And then he says, here's the attitude you ought to have toward such people whose mouths must be stopped. Must be. We don't have a problem understanding that. What if there had been a whole lot of people in the United States after December 7, 1941, said, well, just leave them alone. They won't bother us. Just leave them alone. They'll go away. Let, let them have what they want to in, in the Pacific, and uh, we're all right right here. What's it bothering us? Or the same attitude prevailed over in Europe, and, and that happened. 1938, Neville Chamberlain, they gave away Czechoslovakia, saying, oh, that'll be all right. We, who cares about the Czechs? We'll, we'll just give that away, and, they'll, and Hitler will be happy, be satisfied. And he came home from that trip, Prime Minister, holding up that paper they signed, saying, peace in our time. 1938. Now, what happened between 1938 and 1945? Millions upon millions upon millions upon millions were killed because of that attitude. But we don't learn it. And in spiritual Israel, the same thing's true. They subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not. So we must have patience with teachers of error. And we must be concerned for their souls. But, but we must also be concerned with the souls of others. Yes, that's help the teacher of error, but the best way to do that is confront him and teach him and expose his error and show the direction he needs to stop going and where he needs to go. But we dare not let him continue to teach his error freely without being dealing with him. In fact, uh, a lot of people say, well, I've got to study the issue. I do not know how many times I say, well, I'm restudying this. That just goes on. All that does is postpone dealing with him for what he is. I'm restudying this. I could not tell you how many times I've heard that over the years by false teachers who never changed and just wanted to continue to influence who they could. God said their mouth must be stopped. What do you say? Under the guise of love and patience and time to rethink the issue, false teachers have been allowed to continue their teaching. How do you think the church ever apostatized in the first place? Somebody dropped the ball. Somebody wouldn't speak up. Churches have been split, faith has been subverted, Christ and his gospel held up to ridicule and souls lost forever. It's been going on ever since almost the church got here. If you look in the church at Jerusalem, the first sin in the church in Jerusalem was among the members. It had to be if it was in the church. And it had to do with their conduct and their attitude toward money and lying. That's not just in your Bible to tell you about a little incident that happened. That tells you what the devil did right there in the first church among people who are not faithful to the doctrine of Christ. So we need love, but that love holds us to God and to His truth. We need to be long-suffering. That's tr true, but it doesn't mean while we're long-suffering, we're not teaching the truth and exposing error. We need time to study. We all do. That doesn't mean we're to let people do as they please to the detriment of the church. You wouldn't do that in your home, would you? You'd guard your home, wouldn't you? Why are people homeschooled? Well, it's because they trust the public school so much, and they plus the curriculum. That's why they homeschool. Well, you know better than that. You homeschool because of what's going on in the public schools. You can't trust them. And you warn your children about going into even higher education because you can't trust them. They're not Christians. They don't, they're not for God in Christ in the Bible. And you don't want your kids just thrown out to them without, any, without being forearmed. Because to be forearmed, forewarned is to be forearmed. And so if we understand that about our homes, what about the body of Christ? 
the realm of the saved, the church that Jesus shed his blood to purchase. And while some will deplore the lack of freedom by following those scriptures cited, uh, that we have cited throughout this whole sermon, then we must resolve to follow the truth that set us free, John 8, 31, 32. For that reason, the Lord allows freedom only to teach the truth. Yes, and this is the way this article ended. We live in perilous times, 1973. The church of the Lord is being bombarded from within by a wide assortment of doctrinal errors. The ingratiating personality and a great ability only makes danger in the false teaching that much greater. He goes ahead to write, while we try to save that ability for the work of Christ, let us also have love for the church, concern for the souls of those being taught and respect for God's authority. Let's have enough love for the teacher of error to seek to show him the truth. But let's also have the courage to shut his mouth until he accepts the truth. Clem Thurman, Gospel Minutes, 1973. What, what he saw in those days. Well, I know what I saw in those days is a very young preacher. And it's what he saw. And if you want to go back, you'll find that old brother J.D. Tant, who died, I think, in 1940 constantly ended his articles in the Gospel Advocate and other places, Firm Foundation. Whatever he wrote on, he would end it by saying, Brethren, we are drifting. And you know that's true any time in the history of the world concerning the Lord's Church. Because listen, we're prone to drift unless there's a whole lot going on to keep us from it. Have you ever been fishing? And the anchor came loose, you didn't even realize you were moving. Unless you were catching fish in a certain place, and all of a sudden you couldn't reach it. You didn't realize you'd move, but you start catching fish. That's physically, but at the same time, what about spiritually? What about spiritually? Now I'm going to use this in closing. This is a brand new Bible. It's been back several weeks on a table in our eating meeting room. It is the American Standard Version, 1901. It looks brand new. No name in it, nothing. As somebody forgot this book, a whole lot of folks have forgotten what's in it. So is this yours? Come up and pick it up if it is. I don't know who's it belongs to, but it's your a mighty good Bible just to have laying around. But think about that when it comes to knowing what's in this book and what God requires of us to do regarding what's in this book concerning our faithfulness, not only toward the faithful, but toward those who are false teachers and preparing ourselves to be able to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of hope that's in us with meekness and fear. That means be prepared to defend what you believe and then do it. If you're not a Christian, believe that Christ is the Son of God with all your heart based upon the evidence in the Scriptures, Romans 10, 17. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of sins. Be a Christian, past sins forgotten, all gone, and now you're a child of God. Then if you sin as a child of God, we urge you, we beg of you, we implore you by the mercies of Christ to recognize them, repent of them, confess your sins, and pray God for forgiveness. If you are subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.